Take the Bible literally. Explain it. Yeah, I talked to him, and once you figure it out, tell somebody what you figured out, how you figured that one out. Which chapter were you get? Uh, Second Timothy. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, First Timothy 2.15. So, okay, so why is it important that you be able to explain this verse? Um, because if you, if you read it literally and you don't look at the context around it or understand the reason why it's being said, you could easily think that if you have a kid, then you're safe and you're going to end the kingdom. Like, okay. Okay, so, so a Christian could get a total misunderstanding of it, okay? Or even a non-believer looking at the first. Yeah. Or the exact opposite of what you just said, being um, if you're a barren woman, then you could never go to heaven. There you go. You're a barren woman, you're, 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 you're done, yeah. On top of that, if a woman can't have kids because her husband is not able to mm -hmm. kids, then it means that because of him, she can't Yeah, pregnant. it's his fault she goes to hell, right? Right? And probably on top of that, this is a great one if you're a feminist and you want to be hostile to Christianity. Just grab that one out of there and go, well, you're a Christian. Do you believe this? And they quote that verse to you. How would you answer them? That's why I want, that's why I want you to process this. This is a huge can of worms. How are you going to process that verse? Is that, is that a mistake? Is it a mistranslation? How, how do you process what that means? No, doesn't say that. Well, that's what saved, and it's like there's like six definitions of what you could be saved from. Mm -hmm. So let's let's go down that let's go down that line. What is she being? What might she be saved from? Because when you say the word saved, a bunch of bunch among a bunch of evangelicals, what do you what do you mean? In? Yeah, you mean salvation. You mean salvation. But okay. What if he doesn't mean salvation? What if that's Okay, so maybe you're saved from temptation. Okay, so you think trans... Um, well, that's it then? There's nothing else but salvation? She's saved from her childbearing pains. Pardon? This is the New Living Translation. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it is. That's the one I normally use with you guys. Oh, it's the Living Bible. Okay, Living Bible. Yeah. So with a passage like this, let me help you. Help, yeah. Is it talking that we'll be saved like because Jesus was born of a woman and specifically? Okay, there you go. So, so let me first of all talk you through this. Whenever you see a verse like this or any particular verse that creates, what? What are you saying? 
um, you, have, you, need to, you need to begin to assemble all other verses about the subject matter. If we're talking about the subject matter is being saved, in the sense saved from, for eternity, you need to take a look at every passage in Scripture in the New Testament that bears on that and see if there's anything that echoes that or actually works against that. Okay? And clearly, Paul's, Paul's own writing works against the idea that, that of works righteousness. If bearing children isn't work, I don't know what is. And, and that whole idea that, that obviously cannot be what he's talking about. Okay? That cannot be what he's talking about. So um, to make a case for what Paul was intending, and, and you have to take that out of the equation. So he's not talking about salvation. So then what you have is, well, what is he talking about? And that's where it gets muddy, because every Bible translator I've studied on this gives me a slightly different angle. And so what you can know, you can know what it doesn't mean, but exactly what he was referring to, we are not quite sure. I would say, just like you said, the, probably the best idea is it, it's, it's you're saved by the, by the, uh, through the childbearing, that is, through the, through the child that was born to Mary, okay? That's, it's through that, the, the childbearing of, 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 Mary, of Christ coming to earth, that that's how you're saved, okay? And then, assuming you continue to live in faith, love, holiness, and modesty, okay? And there's, as long as your faith is consistent with that relationship, that, that, with that uh, forgiveness and sin that was born um, through a woman, being the Christ, okay? Now, can you get that out of that verse? Maybe, you know? Yeah, it's a stretch for sure. But again, it's one, there's a few verses in Scripture that just kind of go, uh, what? You know? But we know what Paul doesn't mean, so what we are doing is stabbing around at what he might mean, okay? And, and so if somebody tells you, oh, this is absolutely what he means, yeah, they're probably... Probably, scripture would itself. yeah, it would mean, it would mean, if they tell you they absolutely know what this means, they, they've, they've read Paul's mind and his phraseology and stuff like that, they're probably just guessing, but claiming that their particular version is accurate. And by the way, this is okay to have questions in how certain things are to be looked at. It's totally okay to do that, okay? Because we do know what he doesn't mean, and we've got the bottom end of the verse that really gives the marching orders of what, what a, a woman of faith looks like. And that's really what he was driving to all along. All along. Okay? So, let's... <clears throat> let me get out of this one and go to where we're going today. All right, we're going to talk about leadership. Now we're moving on into the scriptures of leadership. And we're going to start with an analogy of a wagon train. Okay, what's the point of a wagon train? Okay, that, that was the point, right? The point was to get from wherever you're at to, and why would you go to a new place? Land, freedom. Okay, because it's better than where you were, right? Why would you leave what's good to go to some places not so good? And so a wagon train, the point of a wagon train was to, to go arrive at a destination. Now this is an analogy, but I think it'll be a helpful analogy as we consider what leadership's all about, okay? And what does a wagon train need to accomplish its mission? If, the, if, if it's a group of people going from one place to a final destination, in order to, take, to, order to make that work, what does it need? What wagons? You know. Okay, resources. Okay. A destination. Okay, how, how would a bunch of guys in, oh, someplace in Mississippi who want to get to Oregon, how, is there like signposts, go this way? How are they going to get there? Okay, they're gonna, what's that called? In, in wagon train era, what was the guy who was telling you which way to go? What were they called? Come on, come on, come on. Scout. It was a scout. A scout. Okay, a scout was, a scout would go ahead of the group 
and say, okay, the trail goes like this. We're not going that way because that'll take us totally a different direction. If we're trying to get to this destination, we've got to go this way, right? Or they go ahead and they'd say, ooh, um, hey, there's a landslide here. And I've scouted out a new trail. We've got to go over here. So they, they not only direct you towards your destination, but they keep you out of situations that are going to stall you or create problems for you along the way. What else do you need in a wagon train? Not too much By the way, maybe, maybe you don't know how wagon trains were organized. It wasn't just a bunch of people going, hey, let's go. You're going, I'll go. Well, I'll go. These were highly organized situations that you paid money into and joined, right? So to make it work, do you need a scout? What else do you need? OK, you need protection. OK, and you could protect yourself, but you might need some people to protect you, um, people who knew what they were doing you know, on that. Um, what else would you need? Someone to coordinate it all. OK, someone to coordinate it all. What those, you know what the name of that person is? A leader. A wagon master. OK, boy, I'm teaching you history today. Um, a wagon master. A wagon master was the person that sort of organized all of it amongst the wagons. You know, and he was responsible for uh, being sort of the, to the people that were traveling, they saw him as the guy they go to when they had general issues, okay? So what else would you need? Animals, not too much Animals, weight. okay. Not too much weight. What about personnel? Let's think personnel. What, what other kind of personnel would you need? Family. Well, you're, you're, fam you're the family, you're going, so. A cook. A cook, yeah. You know, I heard of a chuck wagon? Yep. A chuck wagon, a chuck wagon was responsible all those wagon trains would have somebody who is primarily responsible for the food. Imagine this. You don't have an ice chest, right? So you'll need a hunter as well, probably. Okay, so you have, to have, you have to organize people to go out hunting that are going to bring back the sustenance you need in order to have the energy and power to continue on your journey, right? And you're going to need people that are going to know how to cook it up. And, and if you have... Some of these wagon trains would have 100 more, more wagons in them. So not everybody has a Coleman stove. In fact, nobody has a Coleman stove. Not everybody has a Coleman stove. And so what you have is somebody who, is a, who runs a chuck wagon who collects. So you shoot a buffalo, right? Your whole family can't eat a buffalo on the, on the plains before it goes rotten. So somebody's going to have to know how to butcher it. They're going to have to set up a big a bonfire, to, a big fire to cook it. They're going to have to disseminate it, make stew out of it, um, send people out to get roots and other stuff you know, that they find out there fire to be able to. Uh, da, da, got it. Got the whole nine yards. Somebody's in charge of that. And it's not the scout. And it's not the wagon master, right? Okay, anything else that you might think would be really handy if you were going out there? Medical. Somebody, somebody knows something about medicine, a doctor of some kind. Now, they might be somebody who travels with you. You pick them up along the way. And they're part of the team. That's why you bring them on. You give them a discount. But somebody, if things go bad, they, that's the guy who stitches you up or that? delivers your baby or whatever. I would say what about midway. Yeah, and they probably have those too. But so we need somebody medical. Anything else? A wagon train bouncing along made out of wood. And somebody knows how to make a, fix a wagon. There you go. Somebody. somebody a wheelwright. Yeah. <laughs> somebody that's a wheelwright. That actually, that's the name for them too. That would, your wheel fell off, you wouldn't just stand there going, uh, I guess we're stuck here. <laughs> Indians are coming for us. You have, you, you, everybody, the wagon train would stop. The guys, the people that knew how to fix that and brought the tools. And, and you, had, you had people traveling there that were blacksmiths. They carried, they carried um, anvils and hammers and all this stuff in their wagon so that when, when a piece of metal broke, you know, you, you weren't going to go to the corner market and order, you know, order more metal or get on, on your phone and have it, Amazon drop it off. You took the metal you had and you had to remelt it and recast it and hammered it out and make, remake what you're doing. Otherwise, that wagon is not going anywhere. And you had to have those kinds of people. Now, this is an analogy of what, of what Paul is going to be trying to tell us about the church. Because if this is an analogy... Well, okay. Um, of all the positions needed for a wagon train to achieve its purpose, which are the most important? All of them. There you go. There you go. Without the scout, you're lost. Without, without the wagon master, 
you have these hundreds of families that start getting into it each with each other and nobody's making peace with them. Nobody's encouraging the vision of where they're going so that when they gripe, how much farther? You know, he has got some idea. You need the guy who can repair the wagons. You need the people who can repair the people. You need the people that can feed the people, the people who can get the food to feed the people with. All those people are important and they have equal value when it comes to the objective, all right? Which is why I think this is a really great analogy for the church. Because as you'll see here, Paul is not, is not suggesting that the church is a single entity man or, or, who just runs everything. But it's, but it's designed to be something more like a wagon train. And where's the destination of the church? What's the destination of the church? Okay, well, eventually, yeah. Yeah. What would be, for a typical church, what would be, how would you know you're on the way to the promised land? Yeah. People are growing spiritually. You know, they're making progress spiritually. That individually and corporately, you're getting closer and closer to, to what, what we will be in full in heaven, right? That we're knowing Christ better, that we're progressing. Christianity is a progressive religion, progressive faith in the context that you just don't get to stay the same. In fact, anybody that comes into Christianity and thinks they're going to stay the same is fooling themselves. The first thing God's going to do is start busting down doors and remodeling everything and trying to get mileage out of us. So that's, that's kind of it. So if we transfer the roles needed in a wagon train to the roles that would be similar in the church, we get all those kinds of things. And Paul's going to go into a, a big list here. Okay? He says this, this is a trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be a church leader, he desires an honorable position. Now, that, that word they use for church leader um, from the Greek means an overseer, okay, which is, in our language, it, a leader would be probably the most apt word. An overseer is not a boss. He's not a dictator. But it's somebody who's making sure that that area works, that he's looking after, is taken care of, works well, etc. <clears throat> and then he starts giving the requirements for that, because in any of the positions in a wagon train, you're not just going to take the first guy that raised their hand. You're going to take the person that, if they're a scout, they're capable and they can read trails and they, they have experience in that area. You want somebody who's experienced in the area. And he starts to lay down. Yes, he starts to lay down the requirements for people that are going to be overseers. And he's going to talk about overseers and he's going to talk about deacons. And we'll see the difference in a second, okay? So, church leader must be a man whose life is above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife. He must exercise self-control, live wisely, have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home. He must be able to teach. He must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. He must be gentle, not quarrelsome, not love money. He must manage his own household well for, and have children who respect and obey him. For a man can't manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? A church leader must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fall. Also, people outside the church must speak well of him so they would not be disgraced and fall in the devil's trap. So that's, that's the qualities for a church leader. Well, a deacon mirrors it very much. A deacon was a table server. That's what the word literally means, a table server, a waiter. And, and so there were two particular roles they had, they had overseers or elders. Um, it's also another term that's used by Peter is, is shepherds. That's where you get the word pastor. Okay. And so, or in the, in the Catholic Church, you get the word bishop. Bishop is another word for shepherd. And so those all mean the same, and they're all the same position with different names. Okay. The deacons were guys, and if you remember in the book of Acts, the 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 12, the, the 12 um, apostles, because remember they, they recruited one more guy after Judas. The 12 apostles, they were busy sharing the gospel, teaching about what Christ had to say. And then they had a social crisis go on. The social crisis was that there was these gals who didn't have a husband and no means of support. And so the people in the church were getting rid of their excess property and, and doing that kind of stuff, trying to divvy money to support them. they take money as alms. And, and they'd have to, they, 
provide support in the way of food or finances for these widows who didn't have children to support them or, or husbands to support them. And you had two types of widows. You had Jewish widows and you had widows that were Jewish but not, but not from a Jewish background. They were, they were born in, outside of Israel and they're becoming Christians. And there were so many of them and there was so much hoo-hoo going on because some were complaining that, hey, the Jewish gals are getting more than the, gent than the people that were born in outside, of, um, outside of Israel are getting. It's not fair, da 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 And they're coming to, to Peter and, and James and John and griping about it. And finally, they go, look, we can't be solving these kinds of things. Let's appoint some people that will do that to help us out to, to be the hands and feet for the intent of the church, which is to take care of their own. And so they appointed table waiters, which are deacons. And here's the qualifications for those, which are very similar. The same way deacons must be well-respected, have integrity. They must not be heavy drinkers or dishonest with money. They must be committed to the mystery of faith, now revealed, and must live with a clear conscience. Before they are appointed as deacons, let them be closely examined. If they pass a test, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives must be respected and must not slander others. They must exercise self-control and be faithful in everything they do. A deacon must be faithful to his wife. He must manage his children and household well. Those who do well as deacons will be rewarded with respect of others and have increased confidence in their faith in Christ Jesus. All right, so here we go. I'm going to pass these out. And um, you can just take one and pass them behind you. Um, I want you to do some ranking on these. Let me take one of those I want you to do some ranking on these and decide for the qualities for an overseer, okay? For not for a deacon, but for an overseer. Which qualities do you think are the most important? And rank, put them in ranks. So the quality you think is the number one importance, put as number one. Number two would be the second most. And, 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 and if it's a tie, just pick one or the other, okay? And you can't put all ones. You, get just, you only get one, 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 two. You know, that kind of thing, all right? Mm -hmm. For a church. Church leader, Christian leader. Are we using all of them in this list? Yep. So you got a number of them here. Well, you know, maybe go to your top 10. We'll probably stop at your top 10. So go one, at least one through 10, huh? Just number them out. The one, you look at them, look at those, think about it. Are we assuming they're already Christian? Yeah, you're assuming they're already a Christian. Okay, that's good. That's why it says Christian leader. <laughs> so if you're looking for a leader, if, you want, if you're looking for a leader, what, what attributes would you say are really important? These are, man, these are the ones, these are super important for me, to me. So you probably should read them all before you mark them. And the ones that you go, man, that's. Did you do it wrong? Do you, do you want another page? No. Okay. I tried to make this idiot proof, but you know, never know. They just put a number next to the darn word, you know?
skills? Well, they sort of could, but not exactly. They're distinctly different. I can be really friendly without being particularly empathetic. In fact, I am not empathetic. Tough. Suffer. Yeah. That's what I told my kids all the time. They rank me very low in empathy. <laughs> I know. Take another minute. Now, this is where it's going to get interesting. Because, first of all, Paul's list is, is not exhaustive, nor is it prioritized. He did not say, this is the most important thing. I'm going to start with, a t I'm going to start with number one. He just, he just blew out a bunch of stuff. In fact, if you start looking at other lists that, that talk about pastors and elders and, and the qualities among, among them, um, there'd be a lot more to add to this. And if you look at the teachings of Jesus, there's even more to add to this. So you can make a list that was much longer than what I gave you. Okay? So what I'm interested in is, what's your number one? Humble. Humble. Biblical knowledge. Biblical knowledge. Loyal. Loyal. Faithful. Faithful. Give me your number one. <laughs> Biblical, okay. I said good. Good communicator, okay. Self-control. Self Wise. Wise, okay. Loving. Loving. Okay. Okay. You see how variety they are? Yeah. Now, what's, now if you go down the list to number two, what's your number two? Okay. Good family person. Good family person, okay. Okay. Here's the, here's the point of this exercise. Pretty much you want all of these, right? I mean, when you look at them, you go, do you know anybody that's all of these? Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Your dad? Okay. So, but to, to hit all of these, to hit all of these notes, if you're, if you're out shopping for a pastor and you go, well, this is the list. We want somebody like this. You're not going to have a pastor. At least when you get him, you go, wait a minute. I thought you were, and then you'll be disappointed, right? Because there's nobody that can actually hit all these notes in a loud way. We can hit and miss some of them, but there's nobody that can live up to these. So what does that tell you? You think your dad does? Well, we need, to, we need to make a saint out of him. We'll have some special day. But normal humans don't normally, and you're just a little biased, too. So um, I'm going to ask your mom what she thinks, OK? Uh, you can ask me. Yeah, but normal humans have a hard time hitting all these things. So, so what's, what's the solution? There you go. That's why when Paul's talking about when he's talking about the leaders of the church, he's, it's a plural leadership, not a singular leadership. Because in a plural leadership, we cover each other's bases. You know, We cover each other's bases. What some person's strong in, the other person might be weak in. And we can, we can make up for that slack. Just like in a, wagon, in a wagon train, not everybody is a scout. Not everybody's a cook. But together as a team, the wagon train goes forward. If it's just up to one guy, the pressure's on. And that's, by the way, why churches, church leaders burn out so quickly, is because oftentimes they carry the load, whether they need to or not. They carry the load entirely. And, the, and to be all this kind of person is virtually impossible for anybody to do. Okay? And God yeah, never designed it. Can I ask what everybody's last one is? Which, well, I don't think we got that far. I don't think everybody... Enthusiastic. Enthusiastic? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there we go. All 
All right, so what's this? There's some questions for you. You are, you have been assigned, the pastor of your church just croaked in the pulpit, okay? <laughs> you know, gone, okay? It's, it was tragic, but he went to heaven. It was a great sermon. He said, amen, and you know, down, down he went, you know? And a great object lesson, too. So um, your, job, your job is to pick a new pastor. What's your best method for picking a new pastor? Take a second, talk amongst your tables. Your job is to pick, what's the best method to pick a leader? How are you going to pick a leader? What are you going to do? Replace the replace that guy. Okay, all right, let's find out how, since you're the board, you're the group, you're the group of people that, you know, you've been assigned to make sure we, we have pastoral leadership in place, how are you going to do it? Okay, so where would you look? Out, outside the church, kind of? Churches, well, I would, I would look inside the church. For like, what is the church's, what does the church think of that person? And what is that person's qualifications? And does that person match what the previous pastor was doing? So you try to match the previous pastor? If that church was doing well. If it was okay. Growing, then you okay. Know, All right. Pastor. Find that person with those skill sets. Okay. How about you guys? How would you do it? Put it in the paper, pastor needed. <coughs> for friends? Okay, all right. So you'd look for outs people outside your community to. How about you guys? Oh, uh, we were just going to pray over dice and then cast lots because God's. <laughs> You've done that before? That's. <laughs> and how did that work for him? Uh, yeah, I didn't. <laughs> Book of, okay. How about you guys? What 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 you what you think? I said I, I don't think I'd hire a pastor if I didn't like know that pretty well. Like I think like I think you kind of like talked about it, but I wouldn't hire someone unless I knew how they acted outside the church. You know, like what their outside life was. Um, so where where are you gonna get him? Where where where, where are you gonna find this guy? This person? Connections. If, like I mean, I think I have a lot of connections with people, you know, or like seeing younger kids grow up, and then like one of my So you look inside the church for him. Yeah, a lot of times, like not all the time. Like if you see someone outside that has qualities, I wouldn't throw them into a leadership, like a head leadership role, I don't think. But um, if if they start to attend your church a while and they still have the same, um, I guess, qualities and principles that you have and the same doctrine, then you you can kind of train them up to be in that more senior position. 
Okay. All right. How about you guys? Okay, what would be We said like a multiple multiple interview process and then probably like a private sermon to kind of see how he preaches and okay. kind of how he yeah, preaches. So okay. The, All right. The way I've seen that done is you have one-on-one -on -one meetings between the person who's the option to bring in and every single one of the board members and then you have a meeting with the one person with all the board members and then you have Okay. How about you guys? Um, I kind of have the idea of like challenging their faith and seeing if they're like firm, firm in the faith and then like seeing what their biblical knowledge is. Okay. Where would you find this person? Okay. Just on the street, at the mall? <laughs> I agree with a lot of what Seth said, but to add to it, like if I want to know someone's character, go on a mission trip. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That, that'll tell you real quick. So how are church pastors most often chosen? Do you have any idea? Interview process. No, but where do they get them? I mean, is it like Pastors, Inc.? You know, you go like, fishing pond for pastors, you know. Yeah, mingle, mingle.com for pastors, yeah. Well, isn't there? I feel like there's some kind of connection. So but that's what I'm asking. Do you have any idea how pastors are generally, not always, but generally, you know, the church loses their pastor, one way or another, and what do they do? So. Yeah, and like in my experience, what I've observed of churches, because as in my family, we bounced around a little bit, so we found the church that worked. There was some just leadership that fell out, so we got to kind of observe that process. And um, usually, like what I've experienced is one of two places. Either it's somebody who is maturing in the church, so if there's like a youth pastor or something that is getting a little older and wants to step up and be a lead pastor, sometimes they'll step into that and then they will look for like a youth pastor position to make sure they mesh and usually those positions are easier then to work up and then it's kind of just that process. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other place that I've seen pastors come out of a lot is mission work. So a missionary who's getting a little older looking to retire and looking to call home somewhere where they can pastor church. And that, that's probably particularly true in smaller churches. Um, you yeah, there's a few. I mean, the, the church that I saw that the most in was it was a church that lost a pastor. It was a church like five, six hundred people. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty, pretty, yeah, pretty good size. Yeah. Okay. Any other ideas where they get them? I feel like there has to be something online where they're like, hey, I need a job as a pastor. Here's my credentials. Because there's something everywhere for that. There pastor. is. Uh, yeah. Try living in Hawaii. Huh? Try living in Hawaii. You know, I mean, if you, if, if we put out a pastor wanted, we'd be swamped, you know. How did uh, KCF, like, kind of get you guys into the leadership role? Well, we were, we were already working in the church, and um, di um, so they were all guys from inside, you know. Even Kyler, although Kyler moved off the island, um, I had trained Kyler in youth ministry. And he came back and worked at a Bible school here. But we knew him. We had a relationship with him. I watched him, I, you know, um, in their Bible, like what we do here. They, uh, they asked me to teach a, a, one of the classes. And so I taught youth ministry. And, and Kyler um, and Jenna's husband were both in that class, which is how that connection came about. Um, Well, that's real good if you're moving your family from a thousand miles or something, well, you know. And they, all, they were moving. Yeah. So. And so most of them shop many. So it, it really varies. Some churches value education. They'll go to, they want you to have a seminary, a seminary, they want a seminary graduate. So that what they're saying is we want somebody who's, and they, they presume that a seminary education makes somebody um, very, very ex, ex, expert in the scriptures, which is not necessarily true, okay? Um, they, may, they may be really good at getting grades, but uh, a lot of the guys you, you've been hearing coming here and that you will hear in, in the next uh, few months do not have a seminary education. Do not, you know, they've gone to a Bible college like you, but they're real students of the word, all the same. And, and by the way, um, 
the author of one of the most famous books in Christianity, um, which probably sold more than just about any other book outside the Bible for, for, for centuries, literally, was a guy who had virtually no, nothing more than what you would equivalent of a high school education. And he wrote it in, sitting in prison. His name was John Bunyan, yeah, Pilgrim's Progress. And it's a brilliant book, theologically sound. So the equivalency of a college education, being able to you know, read Greek and Hebrew, <laughs> And the ability to be a pastor are not, they don't necessarily, they're not always the same. Okay. We have three pastors and they're all like very qualified in that sense, totally not in the middle. Like, right, they're all in there. right, right, right. But that's, the, and someone will go online and they'll get, they'll go through an application process and stuff like that. Um, uh, if it's a small church, they're looking usually for young guys who can work for peanuts, right? Because if it's a large church, they're, you know, they're, they're going after guys, they, they'll pay them. It's sort of embarrassing to me how much, sal how much the salary is for a lot of pastors of a large church. Why would a younger person need less money? I feel like it would be the opposite. Because they're just starting out. Yeah, but typically they, they, you're, you're right. But they usually, have a, they usually have a parsonage. You know what that is? Yeah. A house on the property that they can live in. So that's, that takes care of their rent and stuff. And then they can, they'll work for, for $50,000 or $40,000 a year where you got some guy who's um, real sparkly and, you know, um, real dynamic, and you're going, okay, this is, this is a guy, you know, we really need him, but he's, you know, he's going to want a lot more if he's got a lot of people trying to hire him. So, and it's, it's actually embarrassing to me what some guys get paid. It's, it's really stupid. Um, so, what's the benefit and or dangers in the way that church leaders are usually selected? What are they usually selected? Well, I'm, I'm giving you some of that. They, some of them pick guys from, because of their educational qualities, uh, they do candidates online, or they bring in people and try, give them test, test runs. I think, um, so going back to the example that I had for my parents' church, where they, he was from Texas and he went to Alaska, which is weird since there's no environment, there's no community, there's no people involved. He doesn't know like common things in Alaska. Right, how do you do? Oh, you're okay. He adjusted? Okay, good. Not everybody can. Not everybody can. Yeah. Mine's like kind of the same as hers. It's like they, if you just choose someone based on the education they have, they might not necessarily have the same, uh, they might not have experience in it. So if you choose a pastor that's like, like he went to college, like a Bible college, and he learned about the word and everything, that doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to be a good speaker in front of people because he won't know what Okay. Or past that, you can't judge character off of the degree. Right. That's right. So what would be the best way? Yeah. Um, I was just at our church had like a junior pastor for like fifteen years, like learning under the main pastor. Okay. And he like just passed the baton on. So yeah, maybe just like having the church leaders raise someone up. Okay. We call that grow your own. Probably, and, and look, at, there's nothing in the Bible that says this is the right way to do it, this is the wrong way to do it. It does give some values and some standards of what they, their character is like, and it's really hard to measure somebody's character if you're just getting them online, they come for an interview, because when you go for an interview, how many of you guys have been on a job interview? Okay, so you all know how that is? Did you like go in all dirty and just kind of hang out? And, yeah, man, you know, no, you put on your best behavior if you wanted that job. Okay, um, and you went in and you tried to impress them at, that you could handle that job and stuff because you wanted to be hired. The same is true with pastors when they go to, to when they go to can, it's called candidating. When they go to candidate, they always put their best foot forward. They always try to, you know, show that they're capable. They can do it. Da 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 da. And you don't always know what you got. You, you don't know you don't know how many of these things, how many of these boxes they've checked, and how many where the deficits are. And and so you're you're. You're basically crapshooting on an individual, hoping that they're going to fit, hoping that they're going to have the same vision that the church does. Because they get in, and that guy, that guy might find out he's hanging out with a bunch of you guys, and he didn't really like the way you move. You know, Maybe he wants to be real charismatic. You don't. Maybe you want to be real charismatic. He doesn't. I mean, it can be all kinds of stuff like that that, that mix it up. 
So the smartest way for a church to grow is to, as much as possible, raise up from within themselves, which is what, exactly what Paul is telling Timothy. He's saying, he didn't say, go out and find some guys from some of the other churches down the road. He goes, go into your own church. Find the leaders in your own church. Train them up. Give them the responsibilities. Make them the guys who are going to do it. Find the best communicator. Have them communicate. Find, find the guy that's good with this. Have them do that. Get some people down there below to help them, you know, um, to help support some of the stuff they have to do. You know, the deacons, you know, point some of those guys to help out so they don't have to carry the weight all by themselves. Now, again, there's nothing the Bible says that that's how you have to do it. But the way church is being done in America right now probably could stand quite a bit of retooling because uh, we go through pastors way too fast. And a lot of those pastors get burned out or damaged. A lot of those guys are the right guy in the wrong place. In other words, they have gifts and talents that would be better suited for a different position than what they're given. And we have a lot of guys working in positions that they, that they shouldn't be in because they've got the talents to be in a whole different one that the doors aren't just open to them because they don't have the right pedigree or whatever it is, you know? So Paul is extremely practical here, but this is, the reason I'm going over this is because a lot of you in just a few years are gonna be asked to either make these decisions or influence these decisions. And say, you know, people are in your church, they're gonna lose a pastor, they're gonna retire, they're gonna leave, they're gonna, you know, life will change, they're gonna take up, they're going to the mission field. What do you, what criteria do you want for somebody to help get your wagon train to the promised land? You know, and, and I tell you, if you have, if you already got a chef, you don't need another chef. If you already have a scout, you don't need another scout. So you look for the places that you need somebody and say, who in our community has that kind of gift that, or at least has the beginnings of it. And if they're a little rough in the beginning, they get better and better and better the more they do it. Any questions, any thoughts on this? All righty, let's have a word of prayer. Father, just, just thank you for the fact that you are willing to take completely incomplete people like us with very little skill, very little talent, very, really, very little use to you and make us useful. May we step up to the plate and be willing to serve whenever we're called. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.